Welcome to Carmel Assembly. Thank you for joining us online. We know there are so many places you could have gone and we are honored that you chose to visit. We hope that God's word ministers to you today. If you'd like more information about Carmel, feel free to browse the website. There's also a way to submit your prayer needs. We would love the opportunity to pray for you. Lastly, if you'd like to make a financial donation to the church, you can also do that securely on the website or in our app, which you can find on the App Store or Google Play. Again, thank you so much for joining us today. Good evening, everybody. It's really nice to be with you. Um, I'm from Minnesota. <laughs> I've actually said that in some places where nobody laughed. It's like, <laughs> I like it here already. <laughs> And uh, my husband, when I talked to him this morning, said it was 49 degrees this morning. <laughs> so fall has come. <laughs> but not here, okay. <laughs> uh, so it is truly wonderful to be with you for all kinds of reasons. And I really have come to um, love your pastor and his wife and your staff already, just spending time with them. It's a delight. And you know, when he invited me, I thought, where in the world is Bonifay? <laughs> just thought I'd, I mean, I'm honest here, so I, I looked it up on the web and found out your history, and I'm a, I'm a revival buff, I'm a Pentecostal girl, so that kind of drew me, and I just felt like the Holy Spirit saying to me, that's where I want you to go, so here I am, and um, I'm really, really excited to be with you this weekend. I'm going to share with you, um, I, I've shared what I'm going to share tonight in a couple of other places, but um, what I'm going to share tomorrow, I've only shared in one other spot, and I feel like God is doing a new thing with me in relating um, the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit together in, in teaching and our understanding. And he just seems to be downloading perspective on that for me. I, I, don't you love how the Bible keeps speaking to us? It, it's alive. It keeps new things keep coming to our understanding. And I'm a person that continues to like to mine what the scriptures have to say and apply it in new and fresh ways. So I'm um, so excited to be doing what is basically a, a new um, series for me, and I was just asked to write a chapter in a new um, a discipleship book that the Assemblies of God is putting out, and they uh, had the outline all done, and I, I think it was just from the Spirit, just a couple days ago, they said, we heard you're doing some new stuff on the fruit and the gifts, and so would you mind, we're going to add in a chapter, and we want you to do it, and I went, okay, <laughs> don't, you, don't you love how the Spirit just kind of forges a path for what it is that he wants to say. And so I, I do believe that um, the things that I'm going to share tonight and tomorrow especially are going to be some things that will bring a, a new viewpoint um, to you, um, some new understanding of the importance of both the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit working together, okay? And um, I, I guess for me, uh, I just keep getting new understanding regarding why both of those things, which end up with of the spirit, <laughs> are, are so important to us. Let me just say this. I think that many times we talk about seeing the gifts of the spirit move. And, um, you know, sometimes they're right on and sometimes people make errors and that's okay, that happens to all of us, we'll talk about that. Um, but when they are, when the gifts of the Spirit are done without the fruit of the Spirit being active in a person's life, there's damage that is caused. And so those are some of the things that I want to talk about, particularly um, tomorrow. So kind of think of this as a two-part series in which you're really going to need um, both tonight and tomorrow to kind of get a full picture of what the Lord has in mind for the church in um, working through his spirit amongst us, both in the gifts of the spirit and the fruit of the spirit. 
So tonight we're going to start with the gifts of the Spirit, and I would like to share with you just uh, briefly that it's very interesting how the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, are each one of the members of the Trinity are actually involved in giving gifts to the church. Um, and this teaching um, came to me for the first time from Rick DeBose. Rick DeBose is our Assistant General Superintendent for the Assemblies of God. And he's an amazing man. I hadn't really known him very well, but through a law, large series of events, I ended up um, doing Schools of the Spirit in different districts um, with him and with Joe Oden, who is the new um, person who's in charge of our brand new World Prayer Center uh, that is in Springfield right now, a very exciting spot, by the way. You can actually, they have a big, huge map of the entire world on the floor and you can step onto it it's all it's all done by google earth you can actually step onto it and you can go you can step over any country and pray for that country but it can keep going down it can like focus that country gets bigger you can focus on that country you can go to certain cities in the country you can even go to certain streets and corners and pray over a neighborhood in that particular city. Isn't that amazing? And tons of people have been taking trips to it now that it's open. It's just opened a couple months ago. And actually um, praying over their city. And uh, if you, I don't have time to share it, but Rick DeBose has a whole story about how he had a vision of this. And I believe from what he has said that it was truly of God. He's wanting to step up the prayer effort amongst all of us amongst the Assemblies of God in general and amongst our churches. And I feel like it is a, um, uh, something that the Lord is really uh, giving to us to do, wanting us to do. So Rick talks about, uh, in our Schools of the Spirit, he talks about how every member of the Trinity has actually given gifts according to scripture. And he says there's the gifts of the Father which we see in Romans 12, and I'll talk about each of these a little bit in a while, the gifts of the Son, which we see in Ephesians 4, and the gifts of the Spirit. So all three of them are important. So going back to the gifts of the Father, let me um, just talk about those briefly. The gifts of the Father are interesting because one of the lists of gifts that we have in Scripture is in Romans 12. Here's what Romans 12 says. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Now let me just mention a couple of things about this section, which precedes another part, which I'll go to, which kind of has a list in it. This section is very important. It is basically saying that we ought not, whatever gifts God has given us, however he's made us, or however he uses us, any kind of the gifts from the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Whatever those are, we shouldn't think, hey, we're the most important one here. Wasn't I fantastic? I just got used by God in this particular thing. And he says here, I don't want you to think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. I want you to think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. So he's saying, you know, I, I distribute things differently. I give some a lot of faith. I give some not so much to work in certain gifts. I give this gift here and that gift there, and I, I pass them out. It, it, you know, God is saying, I, I, I give what I want to to whoever I want to. I, I make, I, I just distribute them. It, it's, you're not going to be like anybody else. You're not... You're not like them over here, and they're not like you over there, and, and individually you're not like him, and she's not like you, and wow. I mean, it's basically saying that the body of Christ is so important. 
In fact, the fourth verse of this, Romans 12, says, For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. So he's saying we each are a diff we have a different function in the body of Christ. Now what's beautiful about this is it's basically saying that every one of us is important. So if you lose a thumb, for example, you're going to know you lost the thumb, right? I mean, it's going to be hard. Your the rest of your body is going to feel the loss of that. Or if you Whatever, if you didn't have, if you don't have a certain member of your body, if something is missing, then your whole body is going to not feel right. Your whole body is going to know that that person is missing. So he's saying here, everybody is, has their own function. And each one of those functions is necessary for the body to work the way the body was meant to work. What's incredible about this is, you know, I, I've heard people say, well, I don't care whether I come to church or not. Nobody's going to miss me. It's no big deal if I miss. Yes, it is a big deal. Uh, it, it's a big deal because I don't want to be without my thumb, or I don't want to be without my nose, or I don't want to be without an ear. I, I, so the, the body, whether you know it or not, is going to miss you because you have a function in the body, and your function you were, you were unique, uniquely made to take that function. God distributed certain things to you and you and you and you and, and you. And so it's like nobody else has that. You are the one with that combination. And so your body is going to know it. And he says, yeah, there's many members and all these members don't have the same function. But in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. So even though we each have a unique function, you don't just belong to yourself. You can't, you shouldn't, just wake up on a Sunday morning and say, I'm no big deal, so I'm just not going to be there today. Yeah, you are a big deal. And the rest of the body is going to know it because you belong to the rest of the body. You don't just belong to yourself. You can't think of it in a selfish way. You know, we are such, we are such a selfish world right now. Amen. We take selfies. <laughs> you know, it's, it's an I, me, my generation. My, my, me, me, I don't like it. I think that I don't deserve that. I mean, everything is starting to go towards me instead of the community, instead of, instead of the church body. And we need to press against that because, honestly, it's devilish. It, it, we are not supposed to be idolizing ourselves. We are not supposed to just be doing things in comfort. We are here for the rest of the body of Christ. Praise God. We live a different kind of a life. We've been called to something else. And so it's important you're here because you belong to everybody else. You are not just your own. You have been bought with a price by Jesus, and he's saying, you're part of my body, and I want you with the body. I, I don't want you out there functioning like a little finger walking around by itself. I mean, that would be weird, wouldn't it? I mean, like, oh, there goes a foot. That's nice. <laughs> I've never said that before. <laughs> I may never say it again. <laughs> But, okay, so Romans goes on. It says, we have different gifts according to the grace given to us. So God has just, like, we are able to function in the gifts we've been given because he's given us grace to do what he's called us to do. It's our job, we've been assigned it, and we have the grace to accomplish it. So we have these different gifts, but God has given us the grace to function in that way within the body. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. 
If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Now, Rick DeBose calls these the gifts of the Father because he says it's how we were designed in our mother's womb. And I really like that perspective because it, it's like we see the world in certain ways. So if we are teachers, for example, it's just in us. I mean, even from childhood to start to explain what needs to happen. You know, I mean, you're with your buddy. It's like, okay, let me just know. I mean, it's this one, two, three, four. That's how we do it. You know, they're the ones that are just organizing the things and putting them together. It, it's so interesting because people just start acting like that even as children. Same thing with um, leading. You know, it's like the natural leader who kind of is the one that pulls everybody else and tells them what to do. It's like, here's your role. This is what you do. This is how we're going to accomplish it. it. It's just natural. It's how we were formed. Or in giving, for example, people um, are, are gifted to give. <laughs> they, they have it in them. They they were designed by the Father to be givers. And uh, a lot of these kinds of people, they don't really care about money that much. They like to give it away. They, they have, maybe they're rich, but you wouldn't know it because they are there to do what the Father tells them to do with their money. And on all of these, what's interesting is that if we, we can't start to say that everybody else has to have our gift, Okay, let's say, service is mentioned here, let's say you were um, gifted in that way and you're a server and you just see things that need to be done and you'll go do it. In fact, you have to have something to do. It's like, I'm going to find something to do. It's just natural to do it. It's, it's the way you see life. It, it's like, okay, I get it. This has to be cleaned up. I'll take care of it. Don't worry about that. I'll do it here. I mean, they were designed like this. And this is a gift of the Father for the whole body. But you know what? On none of these gifts are we supposed to start to assume that everybody else is going to see the world in the same way. So if we get messed up kind of with that kind of thinking, we might end up saying, I can't believe it. I'm always the person that sets up the chairs. And I'm always the person that cleans up the stuff. And I'm just fed up with it because it seems like nobody else sees what they're supposed to do and helps out in these things. You're getting the picture. So we cannot use it judgmentally, see, because for us, it's a gift. But for somebody else, it might not be a gift. And they, however, have their own gift that they are contributing to the body. So getting upset uh, nobody else sees it like I do, should not be how we function in the body. We have to give space for each person to, to be themselves, how God made them, and appreciate what it is they do have that they can give to the situation. And then we start saying, oh man, I mean, that person is blessed. I mean, that person has the grace to do this or that, or they're fantastic teachers or they're fantastic how they lead, or they show mercy. I mean, a, a person who has mercy, was, has that gifting, is so amazing because it's like they'll automatically see a person in need. And, and, uh, and they'll see what needs, what, you know, that their hearts go out to them. They have compassion. And, and so again, they could get judgmental. It's like, I can't believe nobody else sees what that person is going through. Nobody else around here cares. No, we do not use it for judgment. We use it as a gift to the body because that's how we were wired. I love how this works because we each are made in a certain kind of combination of gifts. It's not saying that we even have just one of these. Maybe we have a couple of these or, or whatever. But God made us so uniquely, and I don't think this is an inexhaustible list. There's other ways of how God has formed us from birth to be who we are uniquely. And we need to appreciate each other and their gifts as well as to take the, how we were wired and how we see things to provide for the body. Now, there's another listing that I think goes with this, and that's 1 Peter 4. 
This says, above all, love each other unique, deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides. So that in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. And that is really the bottom line. It's like with whatever gifts we were given to by God and whatever grace he has put on us to use those gifts, we do it to the glory of God. We do it because we want to please him. We want his name to be lifted up and not ours. We're not the ones in which we, you know, we're not saying, oh man, I mean, I don't feel very appreciated around here because I just serve and serve and nobody even says thank you. It doesn't matter because we're doing it for the whole body and we don't have to be noticed. We want God to be noticed. We want his kingdom to be extended. That's all we really care about. It's him. We don't have to have all the strokes and the stuff. We just do what we were made to do because God made us part of the body. So these are the gifts of the Father. And actually, I could go on with this for a, a, quite a while, but this isn't my main purpose tonight. So I'm going to move on to Jesus' gifts. And this is interesting to consider. Um, I have a whole book on it, and I did bring a couple of my books. Um, one is on this very thing, and it's on the fivefold ministry, which are actually the gifts of Jesus to the church. And I often teach on this. I think I taught on it at Mariana, didn't I? Um, I often teach on this just as an introduction and also into each one of the fivefold ministries, but. It says, Jesus Christ himself gave first the apostles, this is Ephesians 11, by the way, 4.11. Jesus Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Now, I wish I had the time for this, and, but this isn't my purpose tonight either, but you can get some of that in the, in the book, Catch the Wind of the Spirit. Um, but it, it, right before this section in Ephesians, it talks about uh, Christ descending into hell and winning the victory, and then ascending to the right hand of the Father, if you remember that particular um, chapter. And it's very interesting because what they're really referring to there is the ancient, are the ancient victory marches that occurred in all of the ancient world. So somebody would um, go out and uh, you know, win, take their army and win territory and then they would come back in to the city and there would be a victory march through the city. In fact, Rome was an incredible place. They um, had a, a, when the armies would come back into Rome and you might remember that the Romans conquered most of the then known world, um, actually all the way from Rome and Italy, all the way around the Mediterranean, even down into Northern Africa, all the way into the Holy Land and all the way through, then up into France, into Spain, into Germany, and over even into England and Scotland. So they were, um, you know, they, they had a huge, huge territory that they conquered. Well, when they came back in, they would have been gone months sometimes because, I mean, you're not just going to walk into those areas very fast, so taking a whole army with you. But they would have a victory march, and it would start out and go through, wind through the city, and it would actually take three days to go through the city. And when it was done, then the general would give out prizes. He would give out to the armies and the people who had done big digs for him, he would give out gifts to them. And you could actually get rich overnight. I mean, you know, they had conquered, they had gotten gold vases and jewelry and, you know, they had conquered all this territory and gotten all the most wealthy things and the general would just start dishing them out. 
So you could be really poor at one point, but if you had done something brave that had helped the army out significantly, even if you were just a soldier, you might get a gift that would make you like a multimillionaire today, um, just suddenly. It was just really pretty incredible. So this is what he's talking about here right before this section. He's saying that Christ gave gifts to men. He gave, he gave gifts to the church. And what's listed here are all very important, what I call currents in my book, um, currents for the church. One is ap the apostles. So that's looking at the apostolic work of a church. And I see here you're very apostolic. Um, you might not know that, but the apostle is the person. It means literally sent out in the Greek. So it's missionaries. It's people that are going around the world to reach unreached people groups. It's people who are um, keeping the DNA of the church, who are taking care of um, church discipline. These are all things Paul did and Peter did, for example, some of the early apostles. They, um, they, they established the church. They helped go out into a territory that Satan had previously held and helped establish the church in that particular section. So I see it doesn't take long to figure out just by walking in here and walk out your door here that this is an apostolic church because you are giving to missionaries. You are sending out. You're not just like seeing yourself in some little territory. You're wanting to expand out into your area. You're wanting to expand out past your area. You're wanting to make an impact in the world today. And that is the basis of the apostles. The prophets are people who are helping to um, encourage, correct, build up, um, edify a church, help lead us into the future. There's so much that prophets do. Just because a person prophesies, by the way, as a gift of the Spirit, doesn't mean that they're a prophet in the sense that it's talking about here. These are people who are in leadership, but there should be a flow of the prophetic in every church. And I've often already heard some things that lead me to believe that that's true here, that there are people who work in the prophetic, that you're wanting the direction of the Lord and you're open to the prophetic. And that flow needs to be in every healthy church. And then there's the evangelists, the people who are going out and winning souls, and by the way, I think the laity, uh, I think every lay person is involved, should be, and is involved in one of these currents. For example, if you're a greeter at the door, you're doing more than just shaking hands. You're not just, good morning, how are you today? <laughs> no, you've got a heart for the people who are coming in. Who's new? Um, how do you help them? How do you help them want to come and know that they're welcome to come? You know, you're, you're, you, you have a heart to see the people come to Christ and get them connected here so that they can grow and um, come to the Lord. Or you might be talking to somebody regularly that you're getting a chance to chat with and, and witness to them and you're just opening yourself to them. I mean, all of these are, prof are evangelistic activities that anybody can participate in. And then you have the pastors who care for people, make sure that, that they're cared for and loved and um, you know, visited when they have needs and so forth and so on, that they're shepherded basically and the sheep are being taken care of and are healthy. And then you have teachers who are helping the new people grow and be discipled to become like Jesus themselves. If all of those five gifts are functioning correctly in the church, you've got a strong church. And again, I don't have time to go into all of this, but you can pick up some more um, in, in other places. But um, So these five gifts are there for what? Again, they're not just for them. They're not for the people who were called or gifted or called into these, you know, brought into these areas. It's to equip his people for works of service so that the body may be built up. 
So you have other, you have people on staff who are teaching you how to do evangelism, hopefully, who are teaching you how to think in the prophetic, who are teaching you to care about the apostolic. The fact that these things are flowing meaning that are, means that you're really learning already about these particular giftings and you're being equipped yourself to do the work of service so that the whole body of Christ may be built up. And then verse 13, here we come again, until we all reach the unity in the faith. Do you notice how many times the gifts are, are talked about in relationship to unity, for like the whole body being one, the unity of the faith, and in the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature. It's like this is what's going to help us grow up. When these five gifts are at work in the church, we'll grow and will attain to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Well, that is huge, that is packed. Um, what it's basically saying is that when these five giftings and currents are flowing within the church, then you're going to end up, the church is going to act like Christ in the world today. That is amazing. So these are the gifts of Jesus to us. Now, the next thing that I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to talk about this um, in more detail, is the gifts of the Spirit. And so we come to what gifts does the Spirit give to the church? I believe that um, I, I, we want to like really study these and consider what this is all about because it's important to realize, again, that each of us have roles in the gift of the Spirit. Here is what 1 Corinthians 12 says. Now, about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. So, he's saying here, if, we're really, if we really believe in, in God, um, something's happened to us, and the Spirit has come into us. We, we get saved, and the Spirit comes in. It, it's not like the Old Testament where the Spirit comes upon people, right? Those are the words that are used throughout the Old Testament. The Spirit is there, but he comes upon people. But Jesus had said, it's good that I go away because then I'm going to send the Spirit to you and he'll come in. And, and so it's amazing because the Spirit is inside of us after we're Christians. We have the blessed wonder of having Jesus' own Spirit in us. And he said, you know, to his disciples, I'm really glad that I'm going to leave because then I'm going to send the Spirit to you basically saying, I'm sending my spirit to you. You are going to have me with you, just like you have me with you now. You know, he's saying to the disciples, I've been with you, you think I'm going to leave you? No, I'm not going to leave you. I'm going to do something even better. I'm going to send my spirit, and he's going to enter you. <laughs> he's actually going to be inside of you. He's going to do things through you if you'll let him. He's going to speak to you. He's going to be there to help you. In fact, in the um, New Testament, he's called the paraclete, the one comes, who comes alongside to help. He's right there with you. And this is so awesome because when we think that as New Testament Christians, we honestly have the Spirit right there in us. Wow! <laughs> I mean, this is really fantastic. And, and he says, so, you know, I mean, the, it's my Holy Spirit, and you can't curse God when you have my Holy Spirit in you. It's impossible um, because it's my spirit, so you're not going to, the spirit isn't going to curse me, you know. It's my spirit. And, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. In other words, we can't say I'm following Jesus. He's my Lord. I'm going to do what he tells me to do. We can't say that unless the Spirit is in us, allowing us to say those kinds of things. Wow, how powerful is that? So 
here goes more on 1 Corinthians 12. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit distributes them. Are you noticing a pattern here? <laughs> There's different things that are given out, but it's the same spirit he's saying. You know, you might, you might have one thing and you might have another and so forth and so on, but it's the same spirit. I mean, the spirit is unified. The spirit's going to do things a little differently through each one of us because of how we were made. Now he wants to use us, but it's the same spirit. There are different kinds of service. Hey, but the same Lord. So I might function in one way and you might function a little differently and that's all fine. Um, but it's Jesus himself, it's his spirit in us, so it's the same Lord. There are different kinds of workings. So some might, I mean, we, we might do things a little differently than the other person, and that's fine. It's how we were made, and it's why sometimes God says, well, I'm going to use you today, and I'm going to use you tomorrow, because I, I have a different purpose. I have a different way of working. You function one way and you function another and I need you here and I need you later. Um, we, we all have different ways and workings of doing things. But in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Praise God. You see, God is saying that in the body of Christ, we all have, we can be who we are. We can be how we were made. We can have our individual personalities. I can be me, and you can be you. You don't have to be me. In fact, please don't. <laughs> I don't have to be you. I, I, I don't have to function in the same way as Pastor Jerry, or I, I don't have to function in the same way as anybody. I can be who God made me, and you can be who God made you. I love that. It's basically saying God loves each one of us and he developed us and made us in a certain way and every single one of us is important for just how we were made. And we don't have to put each other down ever because it, it's like, why would we? It, you're part of the body and, and I'm not going to put anybody else down just because you don't do things the same way as I do. You see, I might be, I might be a, a little finger, but... I wasn't made to be, I wasn't made to be a thumb, you know, I, I mean, don't try to make me a thumb when I'm a little finger, I, I, it's close, but it's not the same, and, and isn't that awesome that that individuality is there for each one of us, I, I just love that God allows us in the body of Christ to function the way we were made, and the, what he did in us, it frees us up to be ourselves more than we can ever possibly imagine. So we each have to be willing to be used in the gifts of the Spirit, every single one of us. Here's the deal. If we say, well, you know, God might be nudging me to be used, I'll just pick something as an example, um, to be used in... Uh, a, uh, a, a, an interpretation of a tongue, this, you know. And, and we say, he doesn't need me because Henrietta, is there a Henrietta here? <laughs> I always worry about this when I choose a name. <laughs> because Henrietta will do it. I mean, Henrietta always does it. So I don't have to worry about it today because somebody else is going to take care of it. You, have this, has this ever run through your mind? Okay. I, I want to tell you that's not right. Because he might not want to use Henrietta today. He might want to use you. He, he might want it a little different than how Henrietta would do it. And Henrietta, by the way, needs to realize that Henrietta can't always do it every single time. <laughs> we, we, maybe it's all right to be quiet for a little while. And, you know, I'm used a lot in prophecy, and there are times in which I get a word, but just because I sense something doesn't mean it's me that has to say it right away. I'll just sit back 
and keep my mouth shut for a while sometimes because I'm sensing that the Lord wants to use somebody else. You know, I don't have to hog the scene. <laughs> Nobody has to hog center stage. It's like we should just give space and see who does God want to use today? And by the way, if your heart is thumping and the spirit's going, speak, speak, and you get a message, it's like you better get it. Just go for it. Because God is giving you something. And the whole body, you see, has to be used in different ways in the gifts of the spirit. And it's another reason why we should go to church. Because just in the same way as I was talking about of how Jesus made us, and, or excuse me, how, how the Father made us, and we each come to church with our differences and how we were made, the same thing is true with the gifts of the Spirit. God is saying that sometimes the Spirit is saying, I, I want to use you, or I want to use you, or I want to use you. And you might say, I've never been used in that before. Who cares? Because this Sunday, it might be you that the Spirit wants to use. So, you know, we ought to come into church going, what do you want to do today, God? Would you use me somehow? I'm open. I'm, I'm open. I'm not just going to sit there and say somebody else needs to do it. I am open to what it is that you want to do with me today. And I think that I don't believe in the theory, and I have heard this theory purported, that people kind of get a, a resident gift. I, I'm not sure about that. I, I think that any of us can be used in any of the gifts at any time whatsoever, okay? I mean... I personally have been used in every one of the gifts. I'm not bragging when I'm saying that. I'm just saying I think that's the norm. I, I think there are times in which I should say to myself, I don't know, I mean, I haven't been used in that very much and it scares the liver out of me, but I'm going to be open. <laughs> you know, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see what the Spirit might have today and, and I might step out there whether I feel like it or not. Okay, so... Here's the rest of 1 Corinthians 12. Now to each one of the manifest, each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same spirit, here we go again, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. So, look at all the possibilities that there are here and for how the Spirit might work through us to bless the entire body of Christ. And while we're at it, I'll say, I think the gifts of the Spirit are to bless the world. <laughs> See, I don't think it's just for the body. I think these should be happening anywhere. I think it's possible for us to sense that the Spirit might be speaking to us Hey, in Walmart. I mean, maybe the Spirit says, that person over there, I want you to go over there, and I want you to pray for them. Because I want to heal them. And they don't know me yet, but they're thinking about me, so you're just going over there. Amen. And, you know, we ought to. I think that the Spirit is wanting to reach out into all kinds of situations and people are hungry to see how fantastic God is. Amen. And man, why can we not do that? I will give you a personal example. I um, worked at North Central University for 30 years. So I live south of downtown Minneapolis, where North Central was. It's our, one of our AG schools, by the way, in case you don't know. Um, but, hey, 
you know, I, I live south and I always would, it's a long drive, it was like approximately at least half an hour, sometimes 45 minutes of traffic was bad. And I got used to kind of driving through different neighborhoods because what I decided is I might as well use that commute for, for prayer. You know, I mean, why not use every moment that I can to pray? So I would pray, I would go through different neighborhoods, take different routes. For one thing, it was more interesting, but then I could pray for that area. I really enjoyed doing that. So I was in an area, and I was um, driving up the road, and um, it, it was a bad neighborhood, I'll just say. It was close to downtown. It was um, kind of, po it was a poverty-stricken area. And um, I saw a, a strip mall there that was pretty much closed up. I mean, there were no stores in it any longer. And there was a guy there in a suit. And um, he had a really nice briefcase beside him. And I looked at him, and, and I think that it kind of triggered because it was like he, f he looked out of place, if that makes sense. I mean, this was not a good area, and I just thought, what's this guy doing there in a suit? You know, I mean, it was like, I just noticed him. And right at that moment when I saw him, I felt like the Spirit said to me, Carolyn, I want you to stop and talk to him. Well, I'd like to say that I did stop, but I didn't. I kept going. I was driving, and, you know, it's like, do you ever talk yourself out of something that you think the Lord has told you? I'm glad I'm not the only one. So, I'm, you know, I'm driving away, continuing. And for one thing, we had just had a great big weekend. Um, I was in charge of a big grant from Pew Charitable Trust of half a million dollars to work on urban ministries um, curriculum at, at the school. And we're right downtown. And, and we had had people in from all over the country who were going to help us with the curriculum. And, oh, man, we had had an amazing time. I mean, the presence of the Lord had come into our meetings. And people are on their face crying out to God and praying. I mean, it was like... And, you know, so I was really excited about that weekend. It had ended, you know, it was over. But it's Monday, and I'm thinking, man, I'm still stirred up for the weekend. And so I'm telling myself, you know, Carolyn, you're just like hyper worked up from the weekend and so and and I didn't get anything from God either I mean like sometimes if he tells you to do something he starts kind of downloading why you should stop and what you should say that wasn't happening I wasn't getting anything from the Lord really at all and I thought I don't know what I, you know, so I am driving along, and I still could not get it out of my heart that I was supposed to stop and talk to that guy. And, but I'm still driving in the other direction. And finally, the Spirit said to me, so you're going to be disobedient, are you? <laughs> well, that kind of did it. So I, I turned around, and, you know, I fully expected that since I was turned around now and I was going to stop, uh, go back and stop, that the Lord would share something with me, you know, but he did not. I still had absolutely no idea what I was supposed to say or what it was about. I, I was totally out of my comfort zone in every way, shape, and form. I parked by the guy who was still there, and he was on his phone. And I parked along the side, and I locked my purse in the car, <laughs> and I, w I went up to the corner, and it wasn't a really good spot for a single woman to be standing, if you get my drift. <laughs> so I'm still standing there. He is still on his phone. It was really uncomfortable, and I'm just miserable, and I said to the Lord, was this a test? Can I go now? <laughs> and the Spirit said to me, no. <laughs> he wouldn't have been on his phone if you had stopped when I told you to. <laughs> so I am still standing there and waiting, and finally he gets off the phone. 
and I still had no idea what I was supposed to say to him. And so I went up and said, hi. <laughs> My name is Carolyn, and I work down at North Central, and I actually said Bible College because I thought that might be a hint to him because it had been Bible College, but it had changed its name, but I didn't care, and he wouldn't know the difference. So I said North Central Bible College downtown, and um, um, and God told me to stop and talk to you. You think I could have come up with something any better than that? And he said, well, what did the Lord tell you to tell me? <laughs> and I felt like saying, nothing. <laughs> Okay, not a thing. So I said, well, hmm. I noticed, and maybe you did too, I had said, God told me to stop and talk to you. And he said, what did the Lord tell you to tell me? So I thought, well, that's the only thing I have to go on at this point. And I said, um, you said the Lord, you're a Christian then? And he goes, uh, nah, um, yeah. Well, yes, I could have understood, and no, I could have understood, but e -e, uh, e -e, yeah, I wasn't sure what that meant. So I said, well, you are then? And he looked at me, and he shook his head, and he said, I can't believe you came today. Well, I still didn't know what it was about, but at least I knew I had the right day. <laughs> so I waited, and he said, yeah, he said, I'm a backslidden Christian. He said, I came from New York, and um, he said, I had problems with my family, got mad at them, and got mad at the church that we were going to, and he said, I just got out of there, said I came as far away as I could come, I, you know, ended up in Minneapolis, I just needed to go clear far away, and he said, I got a job, and um, he said, I still can't believe you came today. He said, so my story is that I ended up um, shacking up with a gal when I got here, and he said, I'm not, I'm still married, and he said, but, and I knew it was wrong, but I still did it. And he said, but I felt guilty all the time because I was doing this. And I finally told her, I can't take this anymore and we need to break up. But, and we did. But he said, she still keeps calling me. And she still wants to get back together and she still wants to see me. And so it kind of progressed back. And he said, I can't believe you came today because this afternoon we are supposed to sign um, for a house together and we'd move in together. I said, well, <laughs> you know, I'm not ordained in the assemblies of God for nothing, so I, it's like, I, I, I don't know, the words just came. I mean, it was from the Spirit. I just said, oh, sir, you're just going to be so miserable if you do that. No wonder the Lord told me to stop and talk to you. He doesn't want you to do that because you are going to be worse off than you are right now. And I mean, I was just preaching. I don't know. And, I, and he started, tears run down his face. And So I said, after I talked for a while, I said, so would you pray? And he said, I haven't prayed for a long time. And I said, I know that's why you need to pray. And so I put my hand on his shoulder, and, and he started to pray, and he asked God to forgive him. And while he was, I, I started to pray for him then, and I, I got a vision of him kneeling with his wife at their, uh, by their bedside and him, them getting back together again and the family being restored. And I told him that, and he's very teary. And so... Anyway, long story short, I said to him, so what are you going to do now? And he said, uh, I'm not buying that house. 
and uh, he said, I, I'll call my wife this afternoon. So I, I t gave him some spots where there could be follow-up in a church there if he want, needed that. And, and uh, I left, and I thought, uh, you know, I, I am not proud of that story. You know why? Because I came about this close to not doing that. I mean, I was a hair's breadth away going in the opposite direction. I almost did not do that. And what would have happened to that guy if I hadn't done that? I mean, seriously, I, I think his life would have really taken a nosedive. I, I don't know. I don't know if he would have made it to heaven. I, I don't know what would have happened to that guy. I've thought about that often. I thought, what would have happened if I hadn't stopped? Because I was so close to not stopping. And, you know, after that, I said to the Lord, I'll do anything that you tell me to do. Whether I feel comfortable in it or not, whether I understand it or not, I'm going to do what you tell me to do. Even for people out there, I mean, not just people in the church. I'm hesitant in the church sometimes, too, you know, but outside, too. Like, if you sense you need to do something, in fact, just now the Lord just reminded me of something I need to do. I'll go home and do it. Um, I, I, I feel in the spirit, by the way, that there's a guy that I know that's about ready to commit suicide, and I felt that earlier today, and I, I just feel like the Lord said, you absolutely must contact him, so I'm going to. Um, but I, I am going to obey. Do you hear what I mean? Like, and, and you can talk yourself out of it, can't you? I mean, I can talk myself out of it anyway. I don't know about you, but I might say, well, I mean, what if I'm wrong and that guy really isn't thinking about suicide or, you know, or that guy on the street, like, I don't know what to say. I'm going to be like an idiot. I, you know, and so what? I mean, that's what I finally come to say. So what? Like, what's the worst that can happen? I'm wrong. And what's the best that can happen? Somebody lives, because I write to them and say, do not commit suicide. <laughs> you have a reason to live. Or I stop a guy on the street. As awkward as it was. I mean, seriously, it was awkward. But we don't have... We, we have to start stepping out and taking risks in the, with the gifts of the Spirit. Amen. And, and, you know, it's, it's easy because we start to think, okay, you know, I mean, yeah, the Lord's speaking to me, but is he really speaking to me? I mean, is that really him? Does he really want me to say that? You know, doesn't, maybe, maybe somebody else will take care of that. You get the picture here? No, not necessarily. I mean, honestly, we all, every single one of us, have a responsibility to listen to what the Spirit is saying to us and participate in what God wants to do in the gifts of the Spirit. And I just want to stir that up tonight because I think God wants to see the gifts of the Spirit more in operation in this church. I just really sense that. I think that's why I'm here. So are you going to do it? I mean, I think there's a lot that happens already, by the way. But I think there's more that could happen. And I think that the Lord wants to use you out in the community even more than, he, than you have been used. Seriously. I, I think that this whole area can be changed if Christians just really start to walk in the gifts of the Spirit out there. And so I encourage you to take a risk. Because the worst that can happen is you're wrong. And I don't care anymore. I, I remember after that guy, I had another experience. I was driving along, and I had told the Lord, I will never argue with you again. And I, I was driving along, and I saw a guy walking along the street, and I, the Lord said, stop. I stopped. I mean, I stopped as fast as my car could stop. I backed the car up a little bit, and I went up to him, same thing. I still didn't know anything about him, but I glanced down, and for the first time I saw what looked like a Bible that he was carrying by the strap, but I wasn't sure it was. You know, I just, I wasn't sure. It was covered up. It didn't say Bible or anything. I couldn't see a real book there, but I thought it was a, you know, and, and I said to him, is that a Bible? And he said, yes. 
And the Lord just gave me a word for him. I mean, I said to him, you know, I think that the Lord um, wants to tell you that you have been working, where you're working, that you have been sharing Christ with a lot of people. And he shook his head, yes. And I said, and you haven't seen any results. And he said, no, I have not. I mean, you know, I, I'm, this is, it's just a word of knowledge coming to me, right, about what's going on. And I said, um, so I, I, I feel like the Lord wants you to know that you, you've been thinking, by the way, about stopping, haven't you? And he said, yeah, you, you've thought, hey, it hasn't done anything, so I might as well just quit. And he says, that's exactly the way I've been feeling. And he said, I said to him, don't do that because soon, I really said soon, God is going to bring you a harvest. You're going to see the souls come to, to him. And he got teary-eyed again. He said, I'm going down to a Bible study down the, to the church just a little ways from here. And he said, I need that tonight. You know, there's these people all over. And God wants to use us. And will you be the one, will you, will you be open? I, everybody should be open. I'm serious about that. And I think that it'll be amazing because I think there's going to be testimonies coming out of this church. I just sense it in the spirit. I'm telling you right now, I just sense it. There are going to be testimonies coming. And when you follow through on what I'm saying tonight, then testify before the church about what, how God used you. And it's going to encourage some other people to do the same thing. And I want you to get bold. I want you to get out there and do it. So with this thought in mind, I would like to go through each one of the spiritual gifts. And I have um, one thing to say before I get into that, um, just kind of going one by one um, here. Uh, I, I think that the spiritual gifts are what God provides to believers so that they can pass them on to others, thereby expressing and communicating the character and power of God. Let me unpack this definition. For one thing, I don't think we sometimes act or are told that the spiritual gift is for us, like I got the gift of healing or something like that. I do not believe that is true. I think that what it is is that you are the person who passes on the gift. So if God uses you in, a, in healing you have passed the healing on. Do you see what I mean? You, 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 God's saying, I want to use you in healing. Go pray for that person. So if you go and pray for that person, who gets healed? The person you pray for gets healed, right? So if the person you pray for gets healed, they get the gift. Does this not make sense? So I cannot keep the gift. Don't you like this picture? Because I sometimes get this thing of like, okay, so God wants me to do such and such, to move in a certain gift. And it's like, well, let me think about it. And, and we hold the gift and stop the gift. You get the picture here? It's like we're, okay, God gave us the gift and we're meant to pass it on. We're meant to pass it on to the body or to another person or to give the word of knowledge there. They are the ones that get the gift. But if you keep the gift, you're actually robbing the other person of the gift. Ah, uh, that picture has helped me so much to like flow in the gifts, to move on. Because it's like, I do not have the right to hold the gift. I don't have the right to stop it being given to the person. I have to pass it on. I have to give it to another person, and they're the ones that get it. So by doing that, I have an opportunity to express and communicate the character and power of God because that other person sees that God loves them and has healed them or that other person has um, understanding of the word of, from a word of knowledge that God loves them and is going to do something like I did with that guy when I mean, it was a word of knowledge. Here's what you've been doing, but God has something else to say. And by the way, I think some of the gifts can be almost 
two at a time or three at a time. We don't have to worry about nitpicking. Um, for example, like we could say with a guy with a, on the sidewalk that, well, was that really a word of knowledge or was that a word of, of was that a prophecy? I don't care. I mean, <laughs> I don't care. So we're going to talk here about the Pentecostal gifts of spirit. <coughs> there are three clusters. The gifts of power are miracles, healings, and faith, three of them. So there's going to be three sets. There's nine gifts listed in, in 1 Corinthians 12, gifts of the spirit, and there's three sets of three. So under the gifts of power, miracles, healings, and faith. Then there's the gifts of inspiration, inspirational speaking, and those include prophecy, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. Then there are revelation gifts, and that's understanding that you get in revelation from the Spirit, and these include the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, and discerning of spirits. I am not going to go in this order. I'm going to go um, in the order of 1 Corinthians 12. So I'm going to take them out of order for a variety of reasons, but I'm going to follow along with um, 1 Corinthians 12. And I'm going to go through each one. The first one is a revelation gift, and it's the word of knowledge. This gift of the Holy Spirit is receiving knowledge about something or someone when you have no ability or means of knowing it based on your own human intelligence. It is a divine revelation of the purposes of God. Now, what this means is, if you are using your own human knowledge to minister to somebody, you are not working in a word of knowledge, because it's your own knowledge, right? And, and that's fine. I mean, you can use your own knowledge. I'm not saying you can't, but it's, don't call it the word of knowledge as a gift of the Spirit. The gift of the Spirit is when the Holy Spirit tells you things you did not know about that person. And I have this happen quite often. In fact, I laughed one time at somebody at one of the students at North Central came and they were in my office and they said, I have avoided you for like a year because I hear that you know what's going on in people's lives. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I know it all. <sighs> and he said, I was scared to come in. Well, you know, I, no, I, I don't. It's, but the spirit reveals thir certain things to us. And I remember one time there was a guy who was um, actually a, an MK, a missionary's son, and he was a great guy, and I, he was at a party at my house. I'm going to give you some examples all the way through these, by the way, I hope you don't mind, but sometimes it just helps to have an example of it so you kind of know what it can be. And anyway, I was, we had a prayer meeting for the MKs, and I, I had been praying, and all of a sudden, I knew I had a word of knowledge about this kid. And I knew that he had had, just to be honest, an illicit relationship with a girl, and that, um, you know, he was just torn up about it. I, I could sense that he was torn up about it. And he wasn't the kind of person that I would have guessed that about. I mean, I didn't know anything. I had no information. And, and I kind of struggled with it. It's like, what do you do with that kind of a thing next, right? Well, I, I said to him, as he left, I said, by the way, I, I have something that I would like to share with you. Would you mind making an appointment with me in my office? Because I, for one thing, I needed to pray about it. But I still, I just still sensed that that's what was happening. So he came in, and I said to him, you know, I could be totally wrong on this. I mean, if I don't have this right, tell me right now that, that you'll forgive me because I'm not wanting to hurt you in any way. I'm wanting to help. So if I, what I'm going to tell you, tell me, tell me you'll forgive me if I'm wrong. He said, sure, no problem. So I told him what I felt like the Lord had told me. 
and he started to weep. And he said, this happened once. And he said, I feel so bad about it. He said, I don't think I should go into ministry. I've just been struggling so much. I think I should not go into ministry at all if, if this is what I do. And I don't trust myself. I don't, after this, I don't know what I should do. And I said to him, you know, the Lord gave me this word of knowledge not to hurt you, but to restore you. And, and he, he told me about it because he wants you to know that you're forgiven. I said, you've asked forgiveness a lot of times, haven't you? And he said, yes, I have. And, and I said, you know, and I, I mean, I just started to minister to the kid. And, and the Lord restored him. <laughs> I, I, it was just amazing. And, and he went on. He didn't stop the ministry, thank goodness. And um, the Lord has used him mightily in his life. You know, words of knowledge are to bless people. Words of knowledge, I mean, even if we learn something from the Spirit, that might be tough. He's there to, I mean, he's like a loving father that wants to discipline us and help us to grow and help us to be restored to him. I mean, his desire is always to love on us. So if you get a word of knowledge about someone, whether it's good or bad, it's like God shows you something. You just, you just kind of know. And, and maybe this happens when you're praying for people or be open to it happening while you're praying for people at the altars even, if you do things like that, or you're praying for somebody back in their seats or whatever. It's like you know. You just, something comes to you and you go, where did that come from? But like work in it carefully. I gave you that example so you could see how you can gently like move it along without like hurting the other person. There's ways of doing that. So sometimes I just use it to pray for the person or you know to minister in other kinds of ways to them. But a word of knowledge is incredible. And there's so many um, opportunities where this came up in scripture. One is, remember that when Elijah was discouraged and he said, I'm the only one left. And God told him there were 7,000 who had not bowed their knees to Baal. And by the way, I'm just going to be throwing out scriptural verses. So if you don't know your Bibles, write some of these things down and look them up later. But if you do know your Bibles, the stories should be coming to you fast. So in this case, he wouldn't have known there were 7,000. That wasn't something he knew in the flesh. That was something the Spirit showed him that there were, he wasn't the only one left. He might have feel like he was the only one left. It might look like it, but it wasn't true. There were 7,000. Or Elisha. Remember that um, there was a healing for Naaman, and Elisha would not take any gift as a result of that particular healing, but his servant, Elisha's servant Gehazi, ran out, and he secretly asked Naaman um, for an offering. And then he came back to Elisha, but Elisha knew. Elisha knew what he had done, even though he didn't know. I mean, not by, you know, not by his head, um, but he knew in the spirit what Gehazi had done, and he responded accordingly. Also remember when in 2 Kings 6, Elisha knew where the um, enemy troops were hiding, and um, the Lord revealed it to him. And at one point he said, oh, they're in the southeast corner, and then it happened again, and they were in the northwest corner. He knew, and the king would send to Elijah and say, you know, has the Lord revealed these things to you? Well, that is a word of knowledge. 1 Samuel 10, God told Samuel where King Saul had hidden himself um, because he didn't want to be anointed as king. Or there was the Samaritan woman at the well when Jesus actually said to her, um, you've had a lot of husbands and laid out what her life was. Now that for her was a salvation moment. I mean, that word of knowledge was used not to hurt her, but to say, I understand where you're coming from, but still God wants you. You know, you still have spiritual insight. Or there was Peter and Cornelius knowing how to find each other in Acts. 
I could go on and on. I love the fact that the gifts of the Spirit are throughout Scripture. Um, we can see that the Spirit has worked uh, in the Old Testament and the New Testament. He worked in Jesus' life. The Spirit was upon Jesus, and I think Jesus moved um, in the gifts in, in the same way that we can move in the gifts. He said, as a matter of fact, to, to his disciples, you will do these th as much what I have done and even more you're going to do. So he's saying to the church, you know, you're going to work in the gifts because the Spirit was upon me and in me. Remember when he was baptized and the Spirit came? And, and he said, you can do that as well. Okay, the next one is the word of wisdom. This gift is the supernatural revelation of the Holy Spirit concerning the divine purpose and plan in the mind of God. It may provide guidance to a person or solve a sticky problem. It's wisdom you didn't have by your own ability, but God gives it to you to use in the future. Now, this is a really amazing gift. And by the way, I think we're used to thinking of the gifts of the Spirit as being only um, the uh, speaking gifts, like um, tongues, interpretation of tongues, and prophecy in a service. And by the way, those are all appropriate. I'm not saying they're not, but there's so many other gifts. And, and we need to see that these gifts are all in operation because they all have different kinds of things. And they may not all be so observable to us, and we might even not know what they are when God uses us in them. But I know that there have been times when the Lord has definitely used me in a word of wisdom. It's one thing that I didn't know by myself. I can remember different times when um, profs at North Central, I was the vice president for academic affairs, they would come to me with a problem that they were having in relationship to you know, the school or something that was going on. And by the time it got to me, it was a doozy. I mean, if they could figure it out, they would have figured it out. They are, they are brilliant people. They would, you know, do it on their own if they possibly could. So if they came to me because they needed to figure out something, it was not an easy situation. And I can remember there were times in which I sat there and listened to a prof. He had started and he was saying this and this and this and this. And lots of times it involved a student and he was asking, you know, what he, how it should be handled. And I would be sitting there going, I don't know, I have absolutely no idea what to do with this. I mean, I would not say that out loud. <laughs> but inside, I'm just going, I don't know, good luck. <laughs> that's, that's, what I'm, that's what I would feel like saying. And, you know, I, I did not have personal wisdom enough to know, to have any clue whatsoever on how to answer this person. And I'd sit there and pray, and the next thing you know, something would come to me. And, and I knew it wasn't of me. It was of the Spirit, you see. And, and I'd give that. I'd say, well, here's what you could do. And the person went, wow, that's perfect. I can't believe I didn't think about that. And I say, no, it's God. I mean, you know, the Lord has shown us what to do here. And we need to give him the glory. When he's using us in the gift of the Spirit, then it's just fine to say, I didn't know that. I mean, this is, this is the Lord showing us what to do. Other examples in Scripture would be like Joseph interpreting the dream for Nebuchadnezzar, or like Noah being led to build the ark before anything happened. Um, all the times the Pharisees tried to catch Jesus, he worked in the word of wisdom because, you know, they would set up these little things where they could catch him, and he always seemed to have exactly the right thing to say. But it was a word of wisdom from the Spirit. He would, he would like, this is, what about this, or what about that? And, or he'd write in the sand, or he, the Spirit would show him what to do. And that can help us, too, because in the things that we do every day, there's so many situations, even with our own families, let alone our work and stuff, where we're going, I have no idea. 
And yet the spirit is there. We need to go to the spirit and say, what do you want to do, Lord, here in this situation? And please give me a word of knowledge. I'm, uh, I'm open, excuse me, a word of wisdom. I'm open to a word of wisdom for how to handle or what to say in this particular situation because I have no idea whatsoever. So I think that we need to be, each of us, be open to those times when God is wanting to speak to us. And I do a lot of mentoring. Um, I meet often with people, and they'll often say, you know, I don't know what to do about a certain situation. And I'll listen to their situation. I don't know either. But the next thing you know, I know there's, I sense something from the Spirit, and I'll speak it out. And they know it's from the Spirit too. You know, they'll say, boy, that is, that's God. I mean, that is the answer to that situation. So it's so beautiful. It's a great um, gift to move in in all kinds of situations, in your family situations, with your friends, with, again, with people that you're listening to or having problems. You have an opportunity to really move in the gift of wisdom because the Spirit wants to use you. Okay, the next one is an inspiration gift, and this is the gift of prophecy. This gift of the Holy Spirit is one that the scripture says to especially desire. The gift of prophecy is a supernatural word from the Lord that is to be shared with others to edify, encourage, comfort, and build them up. It can also provide confirmation, correction, or direction, and insight regarding the future. I believe that the gift of prophecy definitely needs to work throughout the church. And I will say this, many people, anybody can work in the gift of prophecy. And I think this current should flow greatly. Do you know that prophecy is the only gift that is mentioned in the list from the Father and the list from the, fa the Son and the list on the gifts? It's the only one that's been mentioned in all three lists of the um, Trinity. And so I believe that it's a very important current and that we are meant to, all of us, have a part in the flow of the prophetic within our church. And I do a whole teaching on this at our Schools of the Spirit, and I don't have time for that, and I almost don't want to get started into it. Um, but I do have a lot of it in um, the book on the apostolic and prophetic um, that I brought for me if you want to mine that a little bit farther. But the prophetic is important. Um, examples, of course, include so much throughout all of the whole Old Testament where, um, you know, the uh, prophets were um, prophesying about the Messiah coming they were prophesying about his death and his resurrection. Um, Jesus himself uh, prophesied about his own death and resurrection. And also that, you know, what would happen in the end times. I mean, he was definitely also a prophet. Agabus, remember Agabus? He prophesied to Paul that he would be taken to Rome. And I think he was preparing um, his own um, Paul's spirit. And, and Agabus also um, prophesied about uh, many other things that were be coming up in the future uh, for famine and things like that. Um, John also um, prophesied in the book of Revelation. So the gift of prophecy, again, can be seen all the way throughout the scripture. The next one I'd like to talk about is a power gift, and this is the gift of faith. This gift of the Holy Spirit grows as we walk with the Lord. You are, are saved by faith, but the gift of faith is different than that. It is knowing full well that you cannot accomplish something on your own, but that the Lord has empowered you to move into new levels to trust him for the impossible and to believe for great things. This gift can bring a supernatural change or lead into a miracle. I, again, if you don't mind, would share a personal experience about this. Um, I, I love testifying about how God moves in the gifts, by the way, so I see this as a testimony. I, I am not here to say, look how, what God did for me, but, you know, how he uses me. But basically, this is to glorify God. 
And I think that it helps to see, I, I'm trusting that it helps you to see how God can use us in normal situations in life, okay? So what, one thing happened with me on the gift of faith that I know was a gift of faith. Um, North Central University, uh, back when, when I first came um, a number of years ago, was, um, wasn't accredited. And we were going for accreditation when I came in and somebody else had been working on the accreditation report. Now, if you're familiar with accreditation, it's in, if any of you are educators, you know what it's about, but it is a huge job, and I was, um, became over it for most of the years, but at that time, I was not, and I still remember um, Don Argue, who was the president at that time, and um, me and the president's candidate sitting together, and in his office, and we had, you know, what had been written already um, that had to be turned in in January, and it was December, um, and, and in our hands, and, and Don Argue said, we're not going to make it, are we? You know, we're going to have to have another round. I mean, they'll come, but we're not going to make it. This, there, things aren't enough in line. And I sat there, and I knew, I just knew, God dropped it into me. I felt like the Holy Spirit said to me, you can make it. Uh, you're going to make it. And, and I said, I looked at the report and I went, I mean, it was kind of against, it was almost impossible. I, I didn't see it either. But I knew that God had put, the, all of a sudden I just had faith for it. That's all I can say. I knew that I knew that I knew that we were going to, it was going to be all right. And the Lord started to download to me what, he said, you can take it and you can do this, 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 and this, and this. I mean, he was telling me this personally, you know, in my, in my heart and my mind. And all of a sudden I spoke up in the president's cabinet and I said, I'm the only one that's saying anything positive. And I said, we can do it. And, and they looked at me, all of them looked at me like I was like, and, and I said, no, I, we can do it. I, I know we can do it. In fact, I, I think I know what we need to do to, to do it. And, and I said, it, can you, would you give me the report and just let me take care of it, do some things with it over Christmas break? John Argy says, well, sure, you can do it. You know, here it is. So I took it, and I, I felt the, during that whole time, the Lord just said, this is what I want, this is what you need, here's what you do, blah, blah. And I rewrote it. And we turned it in, and that year we got accredited. And you know, when the gift of faith comes, it's not just the faith of, well, I hope so, or I'm going to talk positive about it. It's not out of our flesh. We, we know that we know that the Spirit has told us something different. Amen. And that God is going to show us a way. And all of it, there's just that gift of belief that we suddenly have. We need this in our churches. People need this. I mean, we need to say, God, work through me through the gift of faith. So that when I talk to somebody who's down, I am just open to, you know, if, if you're saying a different report, let me say it in the spirit so that things can be activated in the spirit through a gift of faith that I'm working in with for that individual. Wow, it just changes. It shifts the atmosphere. It shifts what Satan is trying to do in their lives, and something just kind of goes, it's going this way, and it goes, ah! it just goes a different direction. Please be open to that activation of the gift of faith in your own life. I think of examples throughout Scripture, like Moses stretching out his staff at the Red Sea, or in 1 Kings 18, Elijah and the, were the prophets of Baal, and remember King Ahab and all of that stuff, and then a miracle occurred. And so the um, gifts work distinctly but can work together, like Abraham when he prepared to slay Isaac, and when Jacob was about to die, he said confidently to the Jews um, that the Jews would leave Egypt and take his bones with them, and he did. Rahab hiding the Jewish spies in the walls of Jericho, and she's listed amongst the um, people of faith in Hebrews. 
Joshua marching around the walls of Jericho seven times. I mean, that doesn't make any sense, but it's what God told him to do. And it activated the faith of the people, and the walls fell down. I mean, like, who knew? How can walls just fall down? That is a gift of faith in, in, um, at work. And Jesus and Lazarus, remember? Uh, that's also a miracle, by the way. And Paul and Silas in prison singing praises. And the jail shook and the door opened and Peter just uh, walked out. <laughs> and there's so many places where the, a gift of faith was activated and suddenly um, amazing things occur amongst us. And we need to be open to this gift as much, by the way, as we are about gifts of prophecy and tongues and interpretation. I know I keep going back to that, but sometimes that's all we see when we talk about the gifts of the Spirit. And there's so many more that can be at work. As a matter of fact, all of them, including tongues and interpretation and prophecy, should work throughout the entire church. They can work at board meetings, I'm sure you know this, committee meetings, Sunday school, or Wednesday nights, or in the parking lot out there, or any time in the hallways, in the bathroom. In, you know, I mean, seriously, let's open up to where God wants to do an amazing work amongst our body because he's at work any day of the week in any place. So we need to be open to those kinds of things. Okay, another power gift is the gift of healings. There are actually different kinds of healings that the Spirit will do. Notice that the scripture says gifts of healings. So both are plural. There's different gifts of healings. These gifts equip you in various ways to bring God's healing for physical problems, mental and emotional issues, painful memories, and other types of sickness, hurt, disease, injury, and infirmity. This is really cool because um, I love the fact that they're plural. I think we really need to focus on that. Healing isn't just physical, although it is physical, but it also can be for hurts that people have from their past that they've lived with or um, emotional or mental issues. It, it can be anything really that is not quite right. God can bring a healing. And I've seen this occur so many times that it, it's amazing. Um, I, I, I've seen some people be anointed with oil and fall out in the spirit and get up and they're different inside. God has totally healed some of the things that have pained them for years. How does he do that? I mean, how does he instantly do something inside of us? Or same thing for our bodies. And by the way, I think we ought to be open about the Lord ministering healing at any point in time. I remember one time I was at North Central. There was a gal who was the daughter of a pastor. She had been in a really bad accident when she was a teenager and she had terrible back problems. She was in constant pain and they really couldn't do anything about it. She had um, people who had come through there had prayed for her many, many times. The church had prayed for her and she had never been healed. And one day, one night, we were at a meeting at North Central, a, a worship service, and at the end the altars were packed and Stacy was up there. And the Lord said to me, Carolyn, I want you to pray for Stacy. And I said, okay. And what I pictured, what came into my mind, is that I should stand, I was standing in front of her and I anointed her with oil. I carry oil with me at all times, by the way. You might just need it in Walmart. So <laughs> I, I prayed for her and she went out in the spirit and she got up and she was entirely healed. She never had a back problem again for the rest of her life. What's amazing is I didn't pray for her for healing. I, I did not. I, I didn't even know I should. I mean, I didn't feel led to pray for healing.
but God decided to heal her right then. I mean, isn't that just, you just never know. So what I'm saying is, whatever God tells you to do, you should do it. You know, it might not make sense to you. In fact, that night, it, the altars were so packed, I argued with the Lord because I said to the Lord, okay, I'll, I'll go up and I'll pray for her. And I went up to, towards her back. And I had my hand on her back and I was praying for her. And I felt like the Spirit said, Carolyn, I told you, you saw it. I want you to go in front of her. And, and I'm saying, how? There's no space. This place is packed. I can't get past her to go up to the next step. I, he said, I mean, it's almost like, do it. <laughs> so I went, mm, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And I prayed for her. Now, I don't know what that was about. I, I really don't. But there was some, that was just the directions. And so I'm saying, follow the directions. You know, whatever the Lord says to do, do it all the way, don't do it part way. And God will do the rest. He's got things in mind. So remember that Jesus did all kinds of healing. I mean, there were just a ton of them. Um, remember, uh, just e even with Peter and um, Paul and all of them, you know, there were healings galore going on. And I believe that the Lord wants to show us even more healings today. Amen. I have an AGS, AGTS student who was um, just healed of a very substantial disease. And I won't go into all this, but I'll tell you that he had a daughter who was just really young. And after he was healed, he, he had prayed for her. Other people in the church had prayed for her. He was a pastor. She didn't get healed. Um, and one night, she was at camp. And he was afraid to, for her to go. She was actually having a muscle disease, and it was very rare, and it was pulling her muscles away from her joints. So she couldn't even raise her hand to praise the Lord or anything, and it was excruciatingly painful. I mean, it was just terrible. And there was nothing they could do for her. And so all of a sudden, um, one night, while she was at camp, their boy... Um, my student's young son felt that he was, the Lord was going to heal his sister. So he got a bunch of the kids at the camp to come around the girl and started to pray for her. And the next thing you know, her, she, he looks over, he's praying for somebody else down on the altar, Robbie was. He, he looked over and his daughter had her, both of her arms lifted up and was praising the Lord and all the kids are getting excited and they're praising the Lord too. And the next thing you know, she pops up out of her wheelchair and starts running around up in front and then, you know, she's like running around the, run to the whole auditorium and she said, I gotta go. And, and she ran up and ran up the hill, which she, I mean, she could hardly walk before that. Can you imagine the kids coming unglued? I mean, you know, it's like, wow, because, you know, God will do anything through anybody. Amen. He uses the children in the gifts of the Spirit. He uses the elderly in the gifts of the Spirit. He uses, I don't care how old you are, I don't care what. He's going to use you. And I, I absolutely love that he does that. Men and women and everything. I mean, all diversity possible. So God does amazing. Next one, we're almost through the nine, is the working of miracles. This is the supernatural demonstration of the power of God by which the laws of nature are altered, suspended, or controlled. This spiritual gift is manifested not by human efforts, but by the Holy Spirit. God works through a person, an animal, or some other instrument to do something which could not be done naturally. God gives instructions so the miracle will manifest. It draws attention to God's might and power. 
Now, I want to make a distinction between healings and miracles. Many times we say a healing is a miracle, and in some ways it is. I don't negate our language, but, you know, to be technical, these two are different gifts. And healing is for the body to be, for us to be physically healed or mentally healed or emotionally healed or whatever. And the working of miracles, notice that first line again. It's the supernatural demonstration of the power of God by which the laws of nature are altered, suspended, or controlled. So it's something that wouldn't normally happen in nature, okay? It's, 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 a, it's a moving past natural functions on the earth. What are some examples? Moses um, doing signs in front, the signs in front of Pharaoh with the plagues, etc., is one example. Um, Moses parting the Red Sea is another example because you normally cannot just put your hand out and the Red Sea separates. So, and bringing water out of the rock. I mean, you know, by the way, with different instructions, again, you've got to follow the instructions of the Lord. I really want to make that clear because at one point he was supposed to wrap the rock and at another point, he was supposed to speak to the rock, and he didn't follow that, and he paid a price for that. Elijah being fed by the ravens at the brook after stopping the rain. Now, that was not usual for a raven to bring you your dinner, you know. And then raising, Elisha, raising the widow's boy from the dead, the flour and oil that didn't run out for the widow, um, the fire-consuming the watered-down altar that Elijah did, I mean, that wasn't normal. Elisha and the borrowed axe, remember when the um, axe fell in and it was, he prayed over it and the axe floated, which, of course, iron is not going to float on water normally, so that was a miracle against nature. Daniel in the lion's den, I mean, that is not normal, natural activity, that you spend the night in the lion's den and come out unscathed. Um, Balaam's donkey speaking to him <laughs> about the angel with a sword that was in front of him. Joshua and having the sun stand still so they could continue to fight in the daylight. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were unscathed, being taken into the fiery furnace while the guards are melting around him. Jesus calming the storm. Philip and the Ethiopian, Ethiopian eunuch, um, Paul raising Eutychus back to life and shaking a poisonous vi viper off his hands with no ill effects. Those are just some examples of true miracles. I believe that God is wanting to restore miracles to the church today. I believe that we're going to see a revival. I believe we're going to see a revival like we have not ever seen one before. And I'm a student of revival history, but I believe God has an end days revival that will blow everybody's mind. I think it will not be in one particular church. I believe it'll be across denominations where people are open to him like you guys are. And I think that we are going to see a revival that spreads around the world, around the whole world, and that the Lord will come back after that. And we need to prepare, and I just want to say that we're going to see a working, a, a reviving again of working of signs and wonders. This afternoon, I felt like the Lord, I was praying, and I, I saw, sorry, <laughs> it was so vivid. Um, I felt like the Lord said, this church that you're going to tonight is going to be a center of revival when I start moving. And you are going to um, see uh, something happen here and in this region that is going to be amazing. And I saw a, a vision of a huge, huge fire, like a bonfire, but bigger. Um, and I felt like the Lord said to me, what you're going to teach tonight, if they take it to heart, they're going to be ready for the revival and for what I have for them. And so, I believe that God is wanting to restore the gifts to his church in ways that 
we haven't seen them. And I know that you've been working in gifts. Uh, I, I, I felt it in the spirit. I, I know that. But you know what? It's not enough yet. It's not enough for where God wants to take you and what he wants you to be ready for. Please hear me. It's not enough. I really want you to, I sense in the spirit, a real yearning to say, please seek after the spiritual gifts. That is, that's what it says in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, right? Seek the spiritual gifts, and especially that you may prophesy, by the way. Seek earnestly the spiritual gifts, it says. And I believe that he wants to prepare you now to be working in these gifts so that you're not trying to learn it when the revival comes. You hearing me? He doesn't want you to be trying to play catch up. He wants you ready to go in this. So I want you to trust and pray for more miracles. More healings. More words of wisdom in the marketplace. More, more um, words of knowledge on the street. Because you're going to need to have them. And I've been in revival myself. I'm I'm an Argentine revival product. I've been down there numerous times when the revival was going in the 90s and I'm still there. I've preached in the churches. I've been in it. I've seen it. I know it. I'm a revivalist at heart. I teach the revival class at AGTS and the DMIN program. Yes, you heard that. The doctoral students are taking revival. And I want to tell you, I don't say this stuff lightly because I know revival history. But I've been in places where revival has happened and it's the lay person, by the way, who was sitting along the wall next to me because there wasn't any room in the pews because they were filled up with visitors. Pray, prophetically, deeply touched my life. God can use you. And he wants to use you. You know, I'm not done with all of the gifts, but I feel like um, I'm done. Um, So um, we'll pick some of this up tomorrow. But I felt like the Lord said um, to end tonight uh, with praying for each other. And so I'd like to encourage you to just turn around and make little groups, everyone in a little group. Um, And I'd like you to really pray over each person, pray pray together that you will be able to follow through on what the Lord just told you to do.